My question is very simple. Why your presentation was not uh, at 10 o'clock uh, in uh, our uh, Institute for Science? Thank you very much. Well, the, the organizers are more qualified than me to answer that question. I'll just speak, I'll just speak on two aspects of it. Number one, I understand that the government claimed, or I'm not sure if it's the government or the Academy of Sciences or if there's any distinction in this particular case, but let's just say the entity claimed that uh, <laughs> because I'm not sure, nobody knows quite what happened. Right. Uh, the entity claimed that it would be one-sided, um, my presentation. Well, first of all, I don't know how they knew what I was going to say. <laughs> they never heard my presentation. Number two, they were the ones that organized the event and it was within their right to have other people speak. I never said no. Intellectually, I find debates much more stimulating than just listening to myself talk. <laughs> so I was very happy to have somebody else speak. Last night, when I was on your television, there was a representative from the Jewish community. Did anyone notice me objecting? Was I disrespectful? I was happy to have him on. So there was no obstacle. If you thought that I would be one-sided, I don't think, frankly, I am, because I just state what the UN says. Now, maybe you think all 164 nations in the UN are one-sided, and I don't think I do much more than state what the International Court says. And maybe you think all 14, and the key question, all 15 judges are one-sided. But each to his or her own opinion, if you thought I was one-sided, you could have had another person answer me. That's what rational people do. And I don't think the problem was that I was one-sided. I think the problem was they didn't want to hear my side uh, because it's difficult to answer when you have the full weight of the entire international community in all of its forms behind you. And now that was the general answer. The personal answer is I have to say, if I'm allowed a personal note, I found it deeply offensive. I came all the way from New York. I did not travel first class. I traveled Polish Airlines. <laughs> and, and leaving aside the six hour wait to go from po Warsaw to Prague, uh, this airline did not have light. <laughs> and I had planned, I had brought, I like flying time to read, and I brought a very thick volume to read, and I kept asking this whole, uh, the airline attendants, light. And they would press, press, and nothing went on, and they conferred with the captain, and the captain <laughs> would turn on the light, and the attendant go, you see? <laughs> and then two seconds later, it went out. <laughs> and then, you see? And it went out again. And after around the fourth time, there was no light, which I began to worry because no light, does that mean no motor? Because <laughs> I assumed it's connected. <laughs> but um, then, the attendant said to me, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not as if 
I traveled first class. The meals, I think they were sold wholesale from Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> Not the most delightful delicacies. And I come all the way over here, and after I'm already here, they cancel. And they never even told me why. And they never even contacted me. It was so rude, so disrespectful. I was really kind of surprised. I mean that. I'm not joking now. You know, I've spoken many times at Harvard. I'll be speaking there on March 25th. I've spoken twice in the Oxford Union. And then suddenly I come to the Czech Republic. It was a significant distance. It was a 15-hour flight. And you can't, you meaning the entity, cancels it. It was as if you were, you know, the, the Czech Academy of Sciences were the Academy of Witches and Ghosts. It was some <laughs> medieval academy terrifying. <laughs> Many strange things in this room. Yes, this young man. Um, my name is Heide Romais. I'm a student at the University of Munich Prague, and I would like to ask you: Do you think there is a different solution, maybe, to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, even though it's not a mainstream solution, such as a two-state solution, uh, which has failed for I don't know over decades? Maybe one state solution, three state solution, anything else? I don't. The question was whether I think there may be other ways to resolve the conflict, and why do I focus on the two state settlement? Because I think it's a basic principle of politics that you can't define international opinion and expect to win. One of the things I learned from reading Gandhi was Gandhi says when it comes to politics, you don't try to change public opinion. What you try to do is to get public opinion to act on what it already knows is wrong. So, for example, in the 1930s, Mr. Gandhi begins a big campaign to rid India of alcohol consumption. It was a big problem there. And many people said to Mr. Gandhi, well, why do you focus on alcohol consumption? Why don't you also focus on gambling, on the cinema, which people thought was also immoral. And Gandhi's answer was simple. He says, because most Indians already agree alcohol consumption is wrong. And therefore, there's a political possibility on getting them to act on their beliefs, because the belief is already there. He says, the other things, they don't agree yet. And so with that in mind, my view is there is already agreement on how to resolve the conflict. And that our challenge now is not to change the opinion. Our challenge now is to get people to act on what enlightened opinion already says is right and wrong. That, to me, is politics. And I think Gandhi was correct on that point. When he organizes the Congress Party, as most of you know, Gandhi was a vegetarian. He was a brahmachari, which means sexual abstinence. Many things, but 